much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. I'm going to be presenting an empirical project that looks at whether patent litigants are winning infringement lawsuits using dependent or independent claims of their patent. What I'm trying to get a sense of uh, with this project is how plaintiffs are using claims and potentially whether plaintiffs are pushing the boundaries of their patents, who's trying to stretch their patents in litigation. One of the most surprising findings, and I think the reason that I'm on this panel, is that non-practicing entities are significantly less likely than practicing entities to be relying on independent claims in litigation, meaning they're winning using dependent claims. So I will explain this in a little more detail as I go through. Uh, I looked at whether litigation is being won using dependent or independent claims of a patent. I think most of you are probably familiar with the idea of independent and dependent claims, but very briefly, patents have different uh, levels of claims that describe the invention in different levels of generality. Uh, independent claims are usually broad and don't depend on any other claims, and then there are successively narrower dependent claims which add details to the invention, and by statute must be narrower than the independent claim from which they depend. This is my main variable, as I mentioned. I use the Let's Machina database to gather my data. I looked at all patents from four and a half million to six million that had been asserted in litigation. I limited my sample to patents where there was a judgment of infringement. And that's because this is where I can actually see whether the infringement falls into a dependent or independent claim. Or at least I can see what the, uh, what the court, the judge or the jury said about that, whether a doctor or not is a different story. Uh, this is an example of what my data looks like. This is a jury verdict, where the jury was asked, does, uh, does the infringing product fall into any of the following claims? The jury says yes, and then I can cross-reference with the patent to see if these are independent or dependent claims. I ended up with 433 patents, about 400 cases in this study. My big picture overall results are that two-thirds of plaintiffs are winning using the dependent claims of their patents. And frequently, they were also winning using independent claims of their patents. One hypothesis that I wondered about when I started this project was, would we see uh, plaintiffs dropping the independent claims, not asserting them, because you worry that independent claims might be invalid, and just asserting dependent uh, that doesn't seem to be driving these results. But there certainly is a lot of strategy involved in how independent claims are asserted and how which ones you want to keep until you go to trial. Also, uh, one other possibility is that some of these claims are actually not valid. It turns out that most of these claims are valid, or at least were never found to be invalid. Uh, this is a high validity rate, but there's previous research that shows that juries and judges tend to take an all or nothing approach to issues in litigation where if they're going to find for the plaintiff, they're going to find everything for the plaintiff. So because I'm looking at cases where there was a find of infringement, this is consistent with uh, previous research that's also no invalidity. So I'm looking at litigation data. There are, of course, major limitations to looking at litigation data. One big limitation is we don't see cases that settle, or cases that are never brought. Priest Klein suggests some ways that we can account for that, but there is also evidence that Priest Klein isn't going to apply in patent cases because there's more than one issue happening. So it's not entirely clear how that bias will cut. One thing that is clear is in the context of MPs, things that I'm not seeing are uh, demand letters, like Robin and Nevin were talking about, and nuisance lawsuits that are never getting to a judgment. So I don't see those. I also don't see cases that lose because I'm looking at cases that win. Um, I'm trying to fix that. I'm trying to gather data on cases that lose. I haven't got all the data on that yet. Preliminary, my preliminary results, I'm looking at what claims were asserted when the, the case came to either summary judgment or trial. And it's strike, actually strikingly similar to cases that win. Here, too, about two-thirds of the plaintiffs are asserting dependent claims when their case goes to judgment. I looked at a lot of different factors. I wanted to try and understand what, if anything, correlated with use of dependent or independent claims. I had various hypotheses about many of these factors. It turns out that only three of them are significantly correlated with use of dependent or independent claims. And that's these three. I grouped these size ones together. Uh, and I'll talk 
more about each of these in a little bit of detail. This graph shows the percent of plaintiffs who are winning these only independent claims, so only the broadest claims of their patents. As I previewed, non-practicing entities are significantly less likely to be relying on the independent claims of their patents as compared to practicing entities, and quite a bit less likely as compared to small companies. Another difference is portfolio size. Plaintiffs who have large patent portfolios are significantly less likely to rely on independent claims as compared to plaintiffs who have small patent portfolios. And then third difference is industry. Plaintiffs in the pharmaceutical industry are significantly less likely to be relying on independent claims. There's no significant difference between the other three industries, but that may be a function of uh, sample size. What I think is happening here is, I think this is explained by how litigation works in the pharmaceutical industry. These are almost entirely ANDA cases, that's brand name suing generic companies. Gen uh, the brand name company will almost always have a dependent claim that covers their product, the actual pill that you take. And the generic company is making essentially a copy of that product, and they're constrained in how much they can change. They're constrained by FDA law. So it makes sense that a lot of this litigation is independent claims. Explaining those other two graphs, though, is a little bit harder. I want to emphasize that my results don't show causation. So I'm going to speculate a little bit on what might be causing these things. The explanations that I'm going to suggest are not meant to be definitive, they're not exhaustive explanations, and they're probably not exclusive explanations. But these are some ideas for what might be happening. Uh, I looked more in depth at the NPE cases because I was surprised by, by the results. They weren't what I expected. And one thing I noticed was many of the NPEs in my sample acquired their patents, as NPEs tend to do. And in particular, they acquired their patents after the infringing activity had begun. You can often see when the infringing activity began by looking at jury instructions. If the jury needs to look at reasonable royalties, sometimes they're given a date for the hypothetical negotiation. So that's where I got that data. Uh, this timeline at the top is an example of how that might work. The infringement here began in 1999. The infringement bought the patent in 2004, and then turned around and started litigating. And looking at the cases, it's also fairly clear that the NPEs here did some due diligence on the patents before they bought them. They, were, they knew about the infringement, and they uh, spent a fair amount of money trying to figure out if this was a patent worth buying. The previous research has shown that uh, NPEs do due diligence on their patents before they acquire them. So what I think might explain my results is a selection effect. It may be that NPEs know their infringement target before they acquire the patent, and so they're selecting patents that are good for litigation. Uh, and uh, there are a few things that might make patent good for litigation, but if the infringement falls into a dependent claim, it means it's easier to win on infringement and it's easier to win on validity because you're asserting a narrower part of the, uh, of the patent. It also, another effect we might see is it may be that NPEs are selecting broader patents. NPEs do, select, uh, do acquire uh, systematically different patents from practicing entities that's been shown in previous research and it comes up in my data set as well. NPE patents, for example, have more claims than non-NPE patents. So if an NPE is acquiring a broader patent than a practicing entity, maybe the dependent claim of the NPE patent is just as broad as the independent claim of a practicing entity patent. And there may be other differences that I can't see using the imperfect proxies that I have. Uh, and a third possibility for what might be happening is this may be a selection in what kind of cases get to judgment. So perhaps juries and judges are skeptical of NPEs and it's harder for them to, to win. And so maybe they need to be further away from the boundaries of the patent to get a favorable judgment. It's hard to tease these out, but I'm hoping that uh, as I gather more data, I might have a little bit more information on it. One thing that is clear and is interesting is that as you narrow the categories of plaintiffs into categories that have more reason to be strategic and more opportunity to be strategic, you see that this effect gets stronger. So on the far right-hand side is MPEs who acquired their patent after infringement. These are MPEs that have both a reason to be strategic and an opportunity to be strategic. And similarly, if you take out individuals and universities who generally don't acquire patents and universities maybe aren't trying to be strategic, uh, you see this effect more strongly than if you include them. So perhaps this has something to do with 
some sort of strategy, although it's harder. It's hard to tease out exactly what. Uh, it's also possible that strategic <laughs> selection is, show, uh, is, is one reason why we see an effect of portfolio size, why we see plaintiffs with large patent portfolios being more likely to win using dependent claims of their patent. If you have a large patent portfolio, you might be able to select an appropriate patent from that large portfolio. You might have a lot of patents covering a particular area. If you have only one patent covering some sort of infringing behavior, you have to use that patent. You don't have any choice about that. And so if you have to stretch that patent, you have to stretch that patent. So this is, that's a brief overview of my data. Uh, I would love to hear questions, comments. Yes. So this is really interesting. Don't know what to make of it. The one uh, thing I didn't see <clears throat> was plaintiffs who win only on de dependent claims. Do you have that data? There are very many of them. Okay. Um, okay. So just the, the... Yeah, so there were about 10 of them. Okay. So I didn't look too closely at those because there's just not, not enough to... Okay, so, to so that's, okay, that's not surprising to me. And so then I don't really know. That would be interesting to me. Uh, why, why plaintiffs are, uh, are winning only on dependent claims. Because in practice, you always want a certain independent claim, I think. I think that's the general wisdom among uh, uh, litigators and people who disagree with me. Because there's some sort of sign of weakness or something like that. It, it, I'm not saying it's rational, but, there, but you always want to lead with an independent claim. Because I think it's a sign of weakness or something like that if you're focusing just on dependent claims. And then adding dependent claims to your independent claim assertion seems to me kind of just as trial, or could be explainable based on just different views of trial uh, strategy. Do you prefer some, uh, simplifying the issues for the judge or jury, or do you prefer kind of a belt and suspenders approach? And that could just vary among uh, types of litigators, and so, and so it could be the types of lawyers who are representing these different entities that could explain it. Um, uh, but that's interesting that no one's winning on just dependent claims. I've looked at, uh, at law firms, and okay. there's a wide variety of law firms are sending these. The effect doesn't seem to be driven by who the lead law firm on this was. I did wonder, not that means it's not a law firm litigation just, strategy, just, and certainly there's a lot of litigation strategy that plays into the choice of what claims to assert. Yes. <clears throat> Is there any way for you to see at the complaint stage whether uh, MPEs are focusing on dependent claims. Because I totally disagree with what was said. You always go with the dependent claim. Anybody who's done litigation, you want the narrowest claim that reads on the accused device because that's the <coughs> hardest to invalidate. And when you're in trial, you go from A, B, C, D, E. Oh, and you don't have all of those things and it's harder to invalidate, particularly before a jury. Uh, but I'm just wondering whether in the complaint stage, if I were trying to hold up somebody, as opposed to having bought a patent that I know these people are infringing, and maybe I'm in a better financial position to enforce it against the, those bad guys who won't pay the the, the original inventor, but will pay me because I got big bucks. Um, to separate that up from the people who are just filing frivolous uh, lawsuits uh, as MPEs to see if they can get some you know, easy cash. So at the moment, you don't have to specify assertive claims in the complaint, yeah. which is really too bad. But do they? I mean, because people are now pushing greater specificity yeah. in claiming. I have, I, I have seen a couple of complaints where you see the plaintiff specifying some claims, but the majority don't. Still not. Um, okay. I'm also, some of these cases come from 10, almost oh, 15 okay. years ago, so yeah. they, they're not necessarily, I, I'm not looking just at um, cases from a few years ago. Uh, it might change though. We, we have some bills pending for Congress yeah, yeah. that might mandate uh, assertion claims in the complaint, so I would love to see how use of claims changes over the course of, of the trial, because I'm sure it does. That would be, so, that would be Maybe my next project. I, I mean, your, your next project, maybe you can get the first interrogatories, and normally which claims you assert. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, if I you go get those. to the first interrogatory, that's number one. Yeah, yeah um, I, I think this is great. Um, 
you know, I mean, one thing just on the, the law firm question, you, you, you could actually run some regressions, right, to, uh, to determine whether there is any, you know, linkage between some of these. Yeah. But, but I mean, I guess, I guess, right, sort of this this point, like, what, what should we make of this? Like, what, what's the ultimate? Well, this is interesting, right? It's interesting, sort of, as a mental exercise. But are we, is this a paper about trial tactics? Is this a paper about prosecution strategy? Is it about like, litigation or um, legislative initiatives to stem or encourage patent trolls? What are we, you know, what are we supposed to make of this? This interesting data set. Great, great question. First of all, there are some regressions in my paper, which I know I didn't post. Um, so even in a regression law firm. Yeah, okay. That that's that's just want to make sure. Um, but yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, what should we make of this? Great question. <laughs> Hard question to answer. Uh, I think that what one thing we should do is there's previous research that so, shows that NPEs can be strategic. That there is this class of NPEs that are being strategic. And so I add to that research by saying, yes, here's an example of how they're being strategic, and here's a particular type of MP that's being strategic, here's one way that they're doing it. But does anybody doubt that they're being strategic? I mean, well, so, some of these who file nuisance suits, for example, might be indiscriminate. So you can differentiate between those two. Um, I'm going to wait until I have more research before suggesting a, a real policy goal to come out of this. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not sure what to make of the data either. I, I'm not even sure I understand. Uh, you focus on uh, when you only win on an independent claim. And what I don't understand, does that include both situations where the only asserted claim is an independent claim and they win, as well as cases where they assert an independent claim and a dependent claim and they only win on an independent claim? Does it include both of those? It does, but the second is extremely rare. For some reason, it's fairly unusual for, for that situation to arise. But I think it's more common, although I'm not seeing it is for a lot of claims to be asserted in the complaint, and then as the trial progresses, maybe as you, you do more discovery, for a lot of the claims to just get dropped, claims that are clearly not being infringed. Uh, I think it's a really neat oh, sorry. Yeah, I think it's a really neat project, and uh, one of the things that, that I was wondering about in the discussion in your, in your presentation is whether there might be some relationship between claim length. So you're looking at dependent and independent, but you could look just at claim length, because really, Trying to get the scope, it may be that you have, for some particular patent, a long independent claim that's more narrow. Yeah. That might explain some of these, at least we have some statistical correlation with some of these. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't looked at that. Uh, claim length might correlate with scope. I'm not convinced it necessarily does, but that would be an interesting proxy it to, might help you to, to see. Right, to do it on why some people are pushing their independent claims. Yeah. Because they might be actually narrowing, narrower independent claims. Yeah, it's a good suggestion, and I think I will try and, and get data on that. Also, it wouldn't be too hard. No. <laughs> no, I have my database. I could do that easily. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, so I think it's a really interesting project. Uh, I think you allude to this a little bit in your talk, but um, I think a lot of you know NP strategy is to have claims with rather vague language and then capture after rising technologies or different technologies that fall under the fold. And that seems to be a pretty good explanation of why you want to use an independent claim, which is typically broad and uh, capturing more things where that same strategy wouldn't be pursued by a practicing entity because that's not their model. Do you have any way of looking for that or testing for that? What I'm, uh, I'm hoping to do as a follow-up project is yeah. look at what actually infringing Great. technology is and what's actually claimed in the patent. So I haven't done that yet, but I would like to compare those two because that would be very interesting. Yeah, because these independent patent. claims are just more useful and the dependent claims if your goal is to just capture more things and kind of snowball the jury. Right. Because like a finding of infringement, as we all know, is not an objective finding that something actually infringed or it's a finding that, you know, uh, an attorney was able to convince a group of people, a non technical people of one thing, uh, in Eastern Texas usually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a lot of these cases were right. Eastern Texas. Yes. Just a thought on um, claims fees. So there was a period I can't remember the exact year, but the PTO changed the fee structure so that when you filed over 20 claims or more than three independent claims, it was just crazy expensive. And I wonder if there's a connection between the quality of independent claims um, pre and post. Because I know everyone after that shifted to we're filing 20 claims, three independent max, uh, and it really changed what your patents looked like. So I wonder if that would play into this choice. Yeah, 
That's interesting. I think big companies may not have made that switch quite they, as much. They did. They really did because okay. it was dramatic. Okay. It was a dramatic fee increase. Uh, it, it was probably around seven to ten years ago. So okay. it's, it's a while, but it really did trickle down into more than I would have expected. Okay. I did some prosecution a couple of years ago, and it, I didn't say as much, but I may have been doing it for a select set. I think that was so, after the fact, too. Uh, yeah. yeah. Pharma also maybe didn't care. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, that would be really interesting. I don't see a break in any particular year. I did look for that, not specifically for this, because I was thinking about it, and I appreciate that suggestion, I will. Um, but I don't, there's no obvious uh, break in time. I, I wanted to see that, see if there's anything happening. But I'll look for that, and I'll look for the year. I appreciate it. Yes? Oh. A thought here, and I'm not sure if you'll find much, if any, of this in your database. But what would be interesting is patents that actually issued after the infringement began, like the submarine type patents where there's continuation from the file. And there, I would expect to see the independent claims being drafted to cover the infringement conduct, and so there could be some statistical, statistical significance. If you had a significant sample size, that you probably don't. That's interesting. It's, it's hard to find the yeah. date of infringement began data. Yeah. I can get that on, on some things, but not on very many cases. But I will look for that, because that would be a very interesting question. Okay. Thank you very much.